and my own loss, and Fisher's, and Early's. I searched for some way to help Early understand why Fisher wasn't coming back. Maybe he just needs more time in the empty space to think things through, get his bearings. I shook my head at my own pathetic tale. Remind you of anyone? Your dad. What? I said, my head jerking up so fast I could have gotten whiplashed. No, Fisher is not like my dad. Yes, he is. No, he isn't. Yes, he is. No, he isn't, I yelled. Early, you don't even know my dad. Yes, I do. You told me about him. Remember when you told me about your soapbox car and how it got warped in the rain and it got fixed? When we started building the boat, you didn't know how to cut an angle or a glue or glue a joint. You said it got so late when you were fixing your soapbox car that you didn't even remember finishing it. Your dad finished it. He took care of you, just like Fisher took care of me. And when we were looking at the stars with Gunner, you knew Orion and Pleiades and Cassiopeia. You learned them when you were a kid, but you said your mom didn't know those names. Your dad's a navigator. He taught you the names of those stars. And I know your dad is a soldier. He did his job and worked hard and wanted to come home, just like Fisher. But something happened that made everything different. And he got lost, just like Fisher. Early crossed his arms, standing his ground. He made your bed and sorted your sock drawer. He loves you. I suppose that, to Early, sorting a sock drawer or sorting a sock drawer would be an expression of love. Maybe my dad looked at it that way too. I didn't answer. Early's retelling of all that I had told him over the past couple months hit me like a slap in the face. My face flushed. Was it from shame shame or anger? But he also took down all of mom's stuff in the house, I said. He was trying to get rid of anything that reminded him of her. He packed it all up. What about that? Early didn't say anything. I'd stumped him on that one. Not even he could come up with an explanation. He thought, then answered quietly. Maybe he packed it up and is carrying it. Like it's his burden. Now I was the one who was left without a response. I stood and checked the clothes by the fire. Just then, there was a clatter and the sound of loud voices outside. We peeked out the window. Up to the hill, maybe 30 feet from the shack, were McScott's men, Olson and Long John Silver. What are they doing here? I asked. They've probably been at the Bare Knuckle Inn, having some spirits and vittles. That's what pirates call drinks and food. I like the way that sounds, spirits and vittles. It sounds so much nicer than ale and ham hocks or bourbon and liver. Now, milk and cookies, that sounds okay. The Bare Knuckle Inn? I interrupted Early's wordplay. You think that's around here? Yes, it's just over the hill. It was right at the bend of the river where the maple and oak trees were in full color. Remember? No, Early, I don't remember. But it would have been nice to know before we camped out in the shack. We've got to get out of here. Maybe we could ask them to give the main back. Now that Captain McScott is no longer with us, he said, using finger quotation marks, that means someone's dead. Or you can also say, kick the bucket, or bought the farm, or cashed in his chips, or gave up the ghost. Early, I know what it means, but it doesn't mean they're just going to hand over the boat. And now that their captain is dead, I said, using my own finger quotes, they'll probably kill us for good measure. I put on my clothes, which were still a little damp. Where do you think they put it? Asked Early. The main? I pulled on my jacket and peeked out the door of the shack to make sure no one was nearby. How should I know? They're pirates. They wouldn't keep pulling it behind their boat in case someone was looking for it. They'd probably stash it away somewhere near their hideout. Yeah, somewhere near their pirate lair, Early whispered. We must have thought the same thing. We must have thought at the same time that the Bare Knuckle Inn was very much like a pirate lair. And that the shack we were in would make a good hiding place for any hidden treasure. Early and I both turned away from the door. We took a corner of the tarp we'd been sitting on and gave it a tug. The deep blue of the main seemed to flood the dingy room with color. We turned the boat over and found the oars tucked underneath. By then, the voices outside seemed much closer and one of them said, Hey, there's smoke coming out of the shed. Early and I didn't wait for the on your mark, get set, or go. We threw our backpacks over our shoulders, hoisted the main, and busted out of the shed. The river was just down the hill, but running with a boat on your shoulder while carrying the oars is harder than a three-legged race. 
Dogs were barking, Olsen and Long John were yelling, but they were either too drunk or too lazy to catch us. Early in the main and I made it safely to the river and were already pulling away from shore when the dogs and pirates arrived, panting and cussing. I smiled. Do you think those dogs are still smelling menthol? Early didn't respond. Not to me, anyway. The empty space, he mumbled to himself. There has to be a mistake in the numbers. Pine needs more time in the empty space. Then Early buried his head in his notebook, jotting down figures or numbers or notations as if he'd had a revelation. With my hands firmly on the oars and my legs and arms pumping in Fisher Auden's boat, I had a revelation of my own. Early had said he felt as though Fisher didn't understand him back at Mrs. Johansson's house, as though he were speaking a language that Fisher couldn't understand. Fisher might have been once a school hero and a legend, but now he was a soldier, and I needed to find another person who could speak the language that a soldier would understand. Who do you think that's going to be? We'll find out next time. See you guys later.